Right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, hi, and, and, and uh, greetings from Putrajaya to all our um, viewers uh, on social media. Um, my name is Fu, and I'm going to be delivering a talk uh, entitled um, The Future of Work for Accountants. So uh, I plan to share my view in terms of um, the future of work in terms of uh, what the accountants uh, uh, will be doing uh, next few years, especially during these uh, uh, challenging times, uh, but also not just because of the pandemic, but also because of uh, IR 4.0, Industrial Revolution 4.0, where we are facing a lot of um, challenges from a technology point of view. So I wanted to share with you my view in terms of the future of, of the accounting profession uh, then what I'll do is I'll speak a little bit about um, what uh, Herod Ward has to offer in terms of programs that we have to uh, nurture and train uh, accountants as well. So, um, so I ho hope uh, you will join me uh, this next hour uh, and uh, feel free to ask me any questions and post them on the, uh, I think it's Pigeon Hole, right? And uh, you, can see, you can get the link below somewhere, uh, around somewhere. Uh, so, uh, but before I start, maybe uh, let me just introduce myself a little bit more to, to all of you. Uh, so, I'm, um, so my name is Fu. I'm the Associate Head of the School of Social Sciences at Edinburgh Business School uh, in Malaysia. And uh, my background is actually in accounting. So, I was trained as a professional accountant. I'm a member of the Malaysian Institute of Accountants. For the first 10 years of my career, I actually practiced as an accountant. I've worked in uh, various industries like the accounting firms. Uh, I've also worked in the industry, in manufacturing, as well as in retailing. So after 10 years I, uh, working in industry, I decided to make a change and uh, joined the education uh, industry about 25 years ago. Uh, so I started out teaching at various levels uh, from uh, pre-university right up to university, right up to master's, MBA, as well as at PhD level, right? So I, I hold a master of, in, in finance and also a PhD in accounting. So I know a little bit about um, the industry, the profession side. I've maintained quite a close uh, uh, contact and networking with the profession. And I have a little bit of experience in the accounting education sector. Uh, so I hope my view and perspective will be useful to you if you are interested to pursue uh, a, a career in uh, the accounting profession and you wanted to know how do you proceed in terms of gaining uh, the right degree and the right uh, qualification to become a professional accountant. All right, so that's the, the goal that I have today. And uh, so let me start really at the beginning and maybe ask this question, uh, you know, what is your perception of what does an accountant, who is an accountant, what does he or she do, all right? And, and so what, you know, you may have spoken to friends, you have, may have spoken to family, relatives, and whatever, and you may have some perception of what an accountant does. And I think traditionally many people think that accountant, the, the work of an accountant is very tedious, very boring. Um, there are many terms being uh, used to call uh, an accountant. Uh, you know, traditionally people call accountants as bean counters, right? Uh, account, uh, accountant, right? So it's from the word account, you think. And then uh, accountants love to count and they love to count beans and they love to count the different colors of beans. You've got the red beans, the black beans, the green beans, and they want to make sure that the beans piles are all equal and all that. So there's this traditional view of, of that, uh, the role of an accountant. Um, the, the, um, the entertainment industry has also portrayed accountant in a certain way. I'm not sure whether you've seen some of these movies before. Uh, in this, this movie, the accountant Ben Affleck, Affleck is portrayed as an OCD person. He's an accountant by day, but also a, a secret agent by, by night. You know, and, and he's very OCD and he loves to, you know, very detail-oriented person. Uh, and then if you go back further, there's this very old movie, you know, maybe your parents would have watched it before. It's called The Untouchables. It's a, it's a very, it's a, it's a fantastic movie, by the way. And uh, it, it also talks about this, this tax accountant in that movie uh, who found a way to actually prosecute um, Al Capone, right, the, the big, 
you know, mafia boss uh, uh, in, in New York in those days. Uh, so, or rather, it's, I think it's in Chicago. Uh, so, you know, again, they portray that the uh, job of an accountant is really very boring, you know, and very nerdish, you know, and, and OCD type people will do accounting. Uh, and what I want to do over the next maybe a uh, few minutes is really to tell you that that's no longer true. Uh, the role of an accountant is really, really very, very wide. You can do almost anything. And it's not just in the accounting profession, you can venture out into many things, right? So let me give you some examples of people that have studied accounting, they have uh, trained as an accountant, but they are doing fantastic work today, very exciting, and they are, they are leaders in their field. Yeah? So let me give you some examples, um, some pictures of people. Some of them you, you probably know very well. Some of them maybe you know, you, you, you're not too sure who they are, but let's go through them. Yeah? So uh, the first one on the far left there uh, is uh, Dato Nor Samsia, uh, who is the um, Bank Negara governor. And, uh, but do you know that, did you know that she was trained as a professional accountant? Uh, she is a CPA Australia member. And, um, but now she's leading the finances and the treasury of the, of the country, right? So she's a leader in her own right. Uh, so, you know, she's, she's no longer really doing, you know, the bean counting work, the bookkeeping work, right? She's actually looking at the finances and the, 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 the economy of the whole country. Then, uh, you know, moving on to, to, her, to her right there, of course, most of you will know who uh, Tan Sri Tony Fernandez is. Um, of, you know, you, you link him with Air Asia. Of course, Air Asia is having challenging times at the moment. Um, but did you know that he was trained as a professional accountant in, in the UK? He's a chartered accountant by training. Um, and, um, you know, he, he doesn't do anything related to accounting. He's an entrepreneur now. Um, of course, he, he was, uh, he was uh, you know, uh, uh, the one that actually uh, brought... Uh, air travel to almost everybody, right? So everybody can fly during the heydays. Um, of course, now he's facing a lot of challenges and I'm sure his training in, as an accountant is helping him to cope, right? And, and diversify his businesses, change his business model uh, so that he can uh, continue to be successful. And then on the, the far right there uh, is Tan Sri Jeffrey Chia. So I'm not sure how many of you uh, uh, know him. Uh, he was my previous boss in my previous life in a different education institution. Um, and um, did you know again that he was trained as an accountant? He studied uh, a degree in accounting in Australia and he was trained. He came back and became an accountant for a while. Uh, but then, you know, he's the, the entrepreneurial bug took him and he actually changed the landscape of a, of a wasteland in, in, in Banda Sunway into, a, into an oasis uh, today. Uh, so I wanted to show you these three people. Um, they're of course leaders today, but I wanted to demonstrate that they are uh, trained as an accountant. They, they, they took up a, their first degree as an account, uh, an, in accounting, uh, but today they are dynamic business leaders. They are dynamic uh, you know, national leaders, okay? and they are really no longer uh, you know, confined into accounting. So. So you know, the, the potential when you, you, when you learn or study accounting is really, really very great. Yeah, so that's the, the thing I wanted to demonstrate. Um, and uh, you know, there's a study done a few years ago. Uh, and if you look at corporate Malaysia, right, the, con the, the largest companies in Malaysia, uh, one out of four of the, the board members, that means these are the, the leaders of these companies, they're actually trained as an accountant. Okay, again, uh, you know, what I wanted to demonstrate here is that if you study accounting, if you're trained as an accountant, uh, you're going to have a lot of opportunities to lead businesses. Okay? Not just as an accountant, but as business leaders as well. Um, so if you are still with me online, if you're not going and, and search something else on YouTube, um, and if, if, if you want to find out more about the profession, let me tell you a little bit about the profession itself and the community and what are the what are the, uh, the things that people do in that profession? So globally, um, you know, let me uh, you know, s pause here for a second or two to ask you, you know, how many accountants do you think are walking on planet Earth today? Yeah, maybe they are not working. They are they're all working from home. Lah, but 
but they are all qualified accountants, right? So can you guess how many would, would you think are you know, the number of qualified accountants in the world today? If you have somewhere above 3 million, then you are right, right? So currently there are about more than 3 million, it's not just 3 million currently, there are more than 3 million qualified professional accountants globally, all right? In almost all countries in the world, any country that has got a, um, a, a business culture, trading, buying and selling provision of services, uh, trying to make uh, generate economic growth and all that, they will need accountants. Okay, so they are almost in any country uh, that you can and can find. Um, so what do they do in these uh, th this three million people, professionally qualified accountants? Where do we find them? Now you will find a significant number of them uh, in the account, what, what we call the accounting firms. The accounting firms such as global accounting firms such as Pricewaterhouse, uh, uh, KPMG, EY or Ernst & Young, uh, Deloitte, right? So these are the main, the largest accounting firms in the world. And what do they do there is that they offer their services to clients uh, in these uh, firms. What sort of services? I mean, the traditional services is things like auditing. Okay? Auditing means that go out and they review other, uh, other companies' financial statements to ensure that the financial statements is reliable. Okay? Uh, so that's what they do uh, in audit. Then, of course, they can actually uh, also provide tax consultation. Uh, they can actually do accounting service providing bookkeeping services as well. Although today there's a lot of um, uh, technology that is uh, taking over the bookkeeping service. They can also do business consulting, telling people how to run their business more efficiently, more effectively, right? So if you want to join these people, this group of accountants, then you can join these big um, uh, accounting firms. Of course, there are also mid-sized firms, okay? And also small firms. There are, there are hundreds of small firms and these small firms are uh, individual accountants who become very entrepreneurial and they set up their own accounting firms to provide services to small and medium-sized businesses. So a, a significant number of them are working in what we call public practice. A larger group of them, in fact, you know, almost two-thirds of, of the professional accountants are working in uh, companies, right? Uh, small companies, large companies. Okay, companies such as Alibaba, Apple, Shell, they employ hundreds of accountants. Okay, and the accountants there help them to do a lot of things, not just reporting, but also um, you know, uh, determining how the, the company is doing, uh, measuring the performance of the company, looking at areas where they need to improve, looking at pricing of products. For example, for Apple, if they want to sell a, an, an iPhone, how much do they need to sell it for? then the accountants are the one that can work out uh, what would be the cost to manufacture one. Therefore, you can set the right price for them. Okay? So there do many of these things in, in the uh, industry. And of course, uh, some of them, not a lot of them, are also working in government. Right? So government today also, you know, they face a lot of challenges in terms of their budgeting, in terms of uh, their development expenditure and all that. Uh, so you know, some of them work in government. And a smaller amount, a number of them are like me. Uh, you know, they, they work in academia doing uh, two things. One is teaching other people about accounting, training other uh, budding accountants, but also doing research in accounting, trying to improve the, the, the process of accounting, the work of accounting. Yeah, so there's a, quite a few of them are there uh, in education. But there was also one group there which I didn't put there, uh, which are probably the Tan Sri Jeffrey Cha of the world, probably the Tan Sri Tony Fernandez of the world. They are entrepreneurs. So a lot of uh, entrepreneurs today, as I've already given you examples, they are trained as an accountant, but they went, up, went out to become entrepreneur. Okay? And, and I think personally, I'm biased of course, but I think that if you study accounting, if you are trained in, as, as an accountant, you are going to have a, uh, you know, an advantage once you go out to become an entrepreneur. Yeah? Uh, you, because you know how profit is calculated. You know how gener profit is generated. And therefore, you sh you know, you, when you start up your business, you, you look at the key issues of uh, uh, profitability. You look at uh, cash flow and things like that. Yeah? So, so that's also something that uh, accountants do today. 
So, um, so now that you know globally, uh, you know, there are more than 3 million accountants walking around planet Earth. Um, let's narrow it down to Malaysia, okay? So how many accountants do you think are in Malaysia? So maybe I'll pause again for a few seconds for you to sort of guess. Um, you know, in Malaysia, you know, uh, 28, 32, I think now it's 32 million people. Uh, how many accountants are there in Malaysia? Okay, so if you guess a number somewhere around there, 37, it's actually more than 37,000 today. Uh, all these are members of uh, one body called the Malaysian Institute of Accountants. The Malaysian Institute of Accountants are the, is an overarching body governing all qualified accountants in Malaysia. So there are about 37,000 plus profe uh, professional accountants in Malaysia. The next thing you probably ask is who are they, right? Maybe some of your parents are uh, also qualified as an accountant and they are also members of MIA. Uh, but let me give you a, a, a sort of snapshot of the profile of, all, of these people. Uh, about, of course, you, can, you, you would have guessed this, uh, around two-thirds of them are actually in the main business areas in Malaysia. Okay, so you find them 63% uh, in the Klang Valley because Klang Valley, of course, is the main industry or economic uh, generation area. Uh, but of course, they're also in some major cities in, in Malaysia, Johor Bahru, in, in Penang, you know, and also if you go to um, East Malaysia, they will be in uh, Kota Kinabalu, in Kuching, right? So as long as they are in, you know, you are in the center of business in any, any country, then you will find uh, accountants there. Um, and interestingly, more than half of the uh, professional accountants are women. All right, and uh, that sort of re is reflected in our classrooms as well. Normally, more than half of our students in our classrooms are also women. Okay, um, I'm not quite sure why. Uh, some people say that women are more detailed, they are more organized. And therefore, accounting is a more suitable uh, career for them. Yeah, they are more, uh, you know, uh, structured in their thinking, more analytical in their thinking. Okay, but whatever it is, I guess we need a little bit, a few more men to join the profession to balance things up. Uh, and they are increasingly getting younger. Okay, so uh, the older accountants are retiring, you know, like myself. Um, but then you, a lot of younger people are joining, right? And every year there are, I think there are about. Uh, close to 5,000 uh, uh, qualified uh, or, or rather graduates of accountant or accounting degrees coming out of universities. Okay, so the profession is increasingly going to be a younger, more dynamic uh, profession. And finally, uh, like I said just now, uh, not all accountants are in the big four accounting firms, you know, the Pricewaterhouse of the worlds and the KPMGs of the world. Uh, you know, all, uh, two thirds of them are actually in industry, like I said, in business, all right? And, and accountants exist because of business. So a lot of them are working in that area, okay? So that's the profile of accountants in Malaysia. Now, some of you will then say, okay, 37,000 plus accountants. Does that sound a lot to you, right? So if those of you who think there's a lot, then you might be thinking, why do, you know, is it, is it uh, you know, will there be opportunities for me when I graduate? You know, is there, is there uh, already too many accountants in Malaysia? Uh, and the quick answer to that is that, no, we still need a lot of accountants, okay? And how many accountants do we need? So there has been um, a number that was uh, talked about for many years, that when we become a developed country, we should have around 60,000 accountants, okay? And those of you who remember, we should have become developed last year in the year 2020. But of course, we, we didn't meet the target. Uh, so now we've set a, a, a different target, maybe in 2030, hopefully um, we can achieve 60,000 accountants. So the point I'm trying to make here is that there's still a lot of opportunities, in fact, um, on Friday, last Friday, we met an uh, accountant uh, who, who has a firm in, in, in Kuching, in, uh, in Sarawak, and she was saying that they, the, the, there's a great demand for accountants, um, even during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, and moving forward, we need more accountants, but we need better accountants. We need more qualified accountants. We need more quality accountants, right? So, so the the, the future is very, very bright for the accounting profession 
um, there, there will not be a lack of jobs for accounting profession. There's still a great demand for it. So, um, but then some of you may have read a report uh, issued in 2018 sometime uh, by the World Economic Forum. And in there, you know, right, you know, and you may have heard of this on, on, on the, you know, the internet and stuff like that, and people have been telling you the machines are taking over, right? And therefore, there will be no job for, for the accountants as well, okay? Um, let, me, let me address that, and let me talk a little bit about that, but let me look at why, uh, what, what, what is the detail of the report uh, that the World Economic Forum uh, produced, right? And essentially what they're saying is that because of technology, because of certain shifts, which I'll share in just a moment, there is now a transference of work that was traditionally done by human beings to what we call robots or artificial intelligence or machines or computers, right? And what are these factors that are shifting the work from human beings to uh, the the uh, artificial intelligence. So a few of these things. One is of course the high speed mobile internet, right? Today, uh, you know the, the speed in which we get information from the internet it's almost instant. Yeah, uh, you, every one of us have got uh, broadband fiber network uh, at your home now, and it's amazing the speed of the internet. Of course, it can be better, but at the moment it's already quite fantastic. So people are able to get information quite instantaneously, right? Whereas during my generation, we actually had to wait for mails, snail mails, we call it, right? To actually come. So high-speed mobile internet uh, is changing the way we work. And artificial intelligence oh, is also changing the way we work. Machines are taking over. People are saying that machines are more intelligent. Well, there are some people who say that that's not really true. Yeah, machines are not really intelligent. What they are good at is they can process a, a lot of information in a very, very fast manner, right? So they can process a lot of information in a very short period of time. And therefore, it appears that they can learn things, right? So if you have a repetitive type of work, like, you know, like in a factory or a bookkeeping for that matter, if it's repetitive and it's the same thing that you do, then the machine can do it very fast for you, right? And that's why they call it artificial intelligence. Not really intelligence. They still can't, you know, think. Some people will say that, you know, many years ago, um, there was a machine who defeated the world champion in, of chess, right? In chess. So some argue that, oh, then they are quite intelligent. But that's not really true because what the machine did was that it could analyze all the possible variation of moves and decide what is the best move, right? Now, if you, if you call that thinking, then maybe that's true. But that's just the power of analysis, okay? Um, so, you know, if your job requires a lot of recurring and repetitive thing, then the artificial intelligence can do it faster. And the beauty of artificial intelligence, they don't get sick, right? They don't get sick. They don't take sick, sick leave. They don't complain. They don't go into depression. So companies love artificial intelligence because they can work them 24 hours and 7 days a week, 365 days a year. So that's another uh, factor that is changing. And following all these things, is this notion of that you know, big data and analysis, right? So with artificial intelligence, you can now analyze millions and millions and billions of data, okay? And they, they can do it very, very quickly. And therefore, they, they can make, uh, you know, what appears to be processes and thinking quite fast, okay? So big data and analytics is one thing. And then it's making all these very, very cheap now because you have cloud computing, Okay, and cloud computing means that you don't have to need, you don't need a, a huge room to store your data. You can actually put everything in the cloud and it becomes very cheap for corp companies to actually take advantage of this. So all these are shifting the work from human being to uh, artificial intelligence and machines and computers. So what's the impact to the accounting profession? And here is where I, I'm very excited about this. I'm very excited for the accounting profession that we now have this artificial intelligence that can take over a lot of our work because a lot of our work traditionally has been very repetitive, very boring, very mundane, putting through entries, you know, looking at vouchers and invoices. 
So all these work now are going to be taken over by machines. In fact, today, you really don't need a bookkeeper. All you need is your mobile phone and a cloud a, a app, an app that is based in the cloud. And you can actually do your bookkeeping just by having a mobile phone. Yeah? So, so the technology is so good that it's taking away all the mundane bookkeeping job, the job of preparing historical reports, looking at what has happened in the past, which is quite boring because you can't change that. Yeah? Um, so all these re repetitive work will now be taken over by machines. And what happened is that it's going to free the accountant to do more value-added work to really make decisions about which business model to, to adopt during the COVID-19, uh, look at different markets, analyze how to improve efficiency and all that. Yeah? So, so what you find now is that increasingly, the accountants can, are freed up to take on what is called future skills. Okay? And I'll give you some examples of them and, and talk through some of them. So on the left here, I've got a few that is increasingly is becoming the role of an accountant. So in the past, accountants are looking at uh, the past, historical records, recording things that happened in the past. All these now can be done by machines. What the accountants will do is look at the numbers and start looking at the impact to the future so that you can help the business grow and become more resilient and become more successful. Right? So forward, you need to be more forward-looking. You need to be more strategic. Strategic here means that you, know, you decide based on an analyzing the information, you can then decide what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Yeah? And, and you, you become more strategic in your thinking. And that's another um, requirement of the accounting profession. And then you've got integrated thinking. Account, accounting, accountants now don't just look at numbers. They look at the impact of numbers to customer satisfaction, uh, the economy, politics, you know, a culture of an organization. They are going to look at everything. Okay? And uh, therefore, they, with all these analytical tools, they are required to exercise professional judgment. So judgment is a thing that machines can't take over. Okay? Because judgment depends on a lot of variables and sometimes you, you don't go by the numbers. You actually look at based on hindsight, based on your feelings, right? Then only you, 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 you actually uh, uh, make your judgment. And then on the other side of it, you'll find that there is increasing responsibility put on accountants because the, the assets of the business is under the custody and the safeguard of the accountant. So the accountants must show a lot of integrity, skepticism and independence. Skepticism means that you don't just take the numbers, you want to inquire further. Uh, no, you don't take you know, a face answer from anybody. You want to inquire and, and, and ask why right? the numbers are like that. Uh, increasingly, companies are being global. So you need to be multicultural, multilingual as well. Right? So some of, you, some of us, if you are good in Mandarin, if you're good in uh, Hindi or, or, or Tamil or whatever, uh, Arabic or whatever, then it's very good because increasingly companies are operating globally and you need to understand different cultures through understanding their language, okay? And, and leadership, of course. Being an accountant is no longer just a bookkeeper. A bookkeeper is someone that does something that is told, told to them to do, okay? The bookkeeper is not really a, a, a leadership position, but you are now going to be an, a finance manager or a chief financial officer or even a chief executive officer or an entrepreneur, and you will become a leader. Right? So you need to know how to lead people, motivate people, take care of people. And finally, your communication must be good. Your command of the language, whether it's English or other languages, must be very strong. And part of communication is also listening. Part of communication is also having empathy for people. Yeah? So you need to know how to deal with people. Essentially, to sum up, accountants today cannot just look at the books. They must be people-oriented. Uh, pro, uh, not people, right? So they must become more people oriented. So this is um, that's why I'm excited about the accounting profession, right? It's no longer just just bookkeeping, bean counting, and all that stuff. Um, so if you are still around and have not gone to other channels in YouTube, then your question will be: Okay, great. I'm very excited. You know, when do I start? How do I start, right? If I want to study accounting. 
Now, the, 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 the fantastic thing in Malaysia is that there's a lot of opportunity for us, for you guys to actually go and study accounting. Okay? There are generally what I call two pathways leading to an accounting uh, uh, qualification. And what are these two pathways? One is the university route. The other one is what I call the professional route. Okay, let me explain what they are. So the university route means that if you guys are, you know, just completed your SPM and uh, you are deciding, you know, where you want to go, then if you want to go to the university, that means you need to go and do a pre-university qualification, maybe a foundation program like at Harold Watt, for example. Uh, and that will take you about a year or so. And then you go to a degree, go to a university, right? So you can go to any university, but again, we hope you come to Harold Watt University and uh, you spend three years there to get a degree. And then um, you graduate with a degree. And after that, you can proceed on to do a professional qualification if you want to become an accountant. But of course, you get a lot of exemptions, right? Especially if you come to Harold Watt and then you become a qualified accountant. Okay, so that's the university route. Uh, the professional route, traditionally, and it's still available to, to um, uh, Malaysians, is that after your SPM, you go straight to join a qualification. Those days, it used to be CAT, Certified Accounting Technician. Now, uh, I think they call it the foundation of, of accounting. Uh, and then you proceed on to do your ACCA. Uh, you could also do, yeah, and you could also go after your SPM if you have a lot of uh, A's you can actually do an ICAW uh, qualification as well. Um, and then you finish all your papers, um, and then you, know, you, you would have completed, and if you have the right uh, number of years of experience, you can become uh, a professional accountant as well. Yeah? You don't have to step, step, up, uh, step in into a university. So this has traditionally been the two ways. And over the years, I've, I've, I've had a lot of students and parents come to me and say, okay, which is the better way? Right? Um, I, my answer to them is there's not really a better way, but there are differences between these two ways. Okay? Uh, essentially, they are just two pathways that lead you to the same place, which is you become a qualified professional accountant. And uh, whether you become successful or not is really you know, what you do with the, the qualification. Uh, so how do you choose between the two um, choices that you have? Now again, I'm not going to tell you which is better because I don't think one is better than the other. Okay? Um, I think it's about you know, uh, some factors that determine you know, whether you choose one over the other. I'm going to give you three uh, factors that you may consider. Okay? Some of these factors would likely be considered by your parents. Uh, and some of them you, you, you may consider yourself. Right? So what are the three factors? One is cost, and the cost is actually connected with the duration. Okay? So what happens is that, generally, uh, if you take the professional route, okay, uh, it is likely, right, there's a high probability that it will cost you a bit less, or well, actually significantly less, uh, and that's because it's also a shorter period of time. Now, that's provided, of course, that you have a smooth sailing throughout uh, your professional's uh, course of study. And, you know, if you are on a ship, you know, the sea is calm, like uh, in the Putrajaya Lake here, which you can't see, but, you know, behind you, there's a Putrajaya Lake. And this, the, the lake is very calm, and you, you take a boat, it will just go wherever you want to go. Yeah? But if, if, you're, if the, 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 the water is it's choppy, like in the ocean, and you've got, you know, waves coming, uh, and then maybe, you know, you will take a bit longer. What I meant by waves is that sometimes, you know, the challenges you face, you may not pass certain uh, modules, all right, and you have to repeat them, and then it will take longer, and then it will become more costly, okay? So what I'm trying to tell you here is that if you are looking at costs and the potential of saving money, and as, as a result of, you know, a shorter period of study, possibly, then you might choose the professional pathway, okay? But the third one is um, something I think is, is more important, but provided you can spend a little bit more money and be patient a little bit and spend a little bit more time studying. And the third one is the experience. So what do you want to experience the next four, three to four years of your study after your SPM, right? 
Um, do you want to experience a university life by the lakeside, fantastic lake here, a calm uh, campus where you can interact with your friends, uh, do fantastic things, you know, get involved in a lot of activities, find your purpose in life, uh, and discover your meaning, you know, uh, if you want to do that, then come to a university, right? If you don't want to do that, and you think you want to go out and work fast, uh, you don't mind the stressful life of uh, uh, mugging for exams, uh, sitting for mock exams after mock exams so that you make sure you pass. Day in, day out is actually practicing on past exam questions. That's the life you may experience in the professional pathway. Okay? So if you don't mind that, then of course, you know. But most of us perhaps want to take their time and really discover themselves. And I'm speaking to parents today, maybe you know, your child needs some time to find out who they are, right? And, and what they really, really want to do in life. Many of them, I'm sure, I, including myself, I've got a, a, a son who really don't know what he wants to do, all right? And, uh, and as, if, you, if you think that's the case, then university uh, experience allows you to do that. Okay, so that's the, that would be my three um, tip for you to think about which pathway you want to, to go into. Um, so, again, if you're still around and you say, well, fantastic now, let me find out a little bit more about what Harold, uh, Harold Watt has to offer. So let me focus maybe the next five minutes of my talk to really uh, touch uh, a lot more in terms of uh, what Harold Watt has to offer, who uh, you know Harold Watt is. Hi. Please do come in, yeah. Hi. Please have a seat. Sorry, we have uh, some guests coming in. Uh, just sit anywhere. Yeah. Maybe not too near to me. Okay. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. You sit there, I'll move away. Right. Uh, the camera has to follow me. Okay. Um, so, so we have a, a, a few people coming in, and, and for the benefit of those peop a few people, um, I've already talked a little bit about the accounting profession to, to people in, uh, in, uh, in, on the internet and social media. Uh, I'm now talking a little bit more in terms of what Harold Watt has to offer, right? And, 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 and uh, who Harold, Harold Watt is, uh, what, what the university stands for. So let me introduce you to Harold Watt. Now, Harold Watt, um, in fact, this year is a milestone for Harold Watt sense that we are celebrating our 200th year. So we are two, two centuries old. Okay? We are that old as a university, that established. Okay? Uh, so we were established in 1821. And if you uh, go back in time and you were living in 1821, uh, let me describe 1821. It's a very exciting period in, in the history of the world because uh, they just invented the steam engine. Right before this, they were all in the in the rural areas, planting agriculture, pro, uh, you know, uh, uh, produce, uh, farming, and things like that. Um, and they were the businesses were not existent, and they were very very self sufficient. They live in the villages. They just plant what they want to eat and all that. Now during these times, 1821, during this period, uh, they just invented the steam engine, and this steam engine could do a lot of the things that humans couldn't do. Okay, uh, they created the train, and the train could take people across long distances and all that. They created a machine that can sew clothes faster than human beings, right? So it was very exciting, but also very worrying because what is this? You know, what is this steam engine? Everyone is very frightened. So they, we set up our university to train people to work in that environment. Okay, so that was 1821. That's how Harold Watt started. Okay, and. Um, and in fact, so that, that period is very important. Hello. Hi. Come join us. Yeah, no worries. Um, I was just telling them a little bit about Harold Watt and the history of Harold Watt. Uh, so, so Harold Watt started during a time of what we call the first industrial revolution, okay, where we created steam engine and, and uh, we were able to do things beyond our human limitations. And as a result, businesses exploded, okay? And, and, and from then onwards, from the late 19th century down to the 19th, uh, 20th century, business opened up. Companies started to form, 
And you know, you know, what after that, as you all know, you you now live in a, a world where you know business is everywhere. Today, we are living in the fourth industrial revolution, where again, there's a lot of things that are changing. I was talking to the the uh, social media um, on the internet to our audience there uh, earlier about the impact of industrial revolution, where a lot of the work of of, of human beings today is being taken over by machine. And that's because of the high internet speed, uh, artificial intelligence and all that. Again, many of us are becoming very um, uh, cautious, very uh, you know, afraid of the impact to our work, especially people uh, you know, of a less younger generation from the young generation here. Um, we are afraid of oh, our machines going to take over our job. All right. And as I said earlier, it, won't take o- it will take over the mundane part of our jobs to, uh, to free us to have a more value-added uh, role in, in, in industry and in commerce. But we are living in the same time period as Herod Watt was set up. All right? And again, I'll, t- I'll, show you, uh, I'll talk about it later on. Herod Watt is doing something to prepare uh, st- our students, our graduates for this unknown world that, is, that we are living in. Okay, but I wanted to just stress that we, when we were set up, it was another phase of, of change in the world. But of course, we've come a long way and we are now in the global university and we are now operating in three main campuses, right? Our, our mother campus is in Edinburgh. There are a, a few more campuses in Scotland. Uh, then we set up the Dubai campus, uh, you know, quite a few years ago. And about around 10 years ago, we set up the uh, Putrajaya campus, as you see here. Okay? So we are a very global uh, institution. And um, of course, today here, all right, so, so you are in the Putrajaya campus. Uh, we've set up, it's a purpose-built campus, right? And it's, you know, the wonderful lake is very calming, you know, so if you want to study here, it's really nice and a peaceful environment to study in. Uh, and uh, here we, uh, we focus on, on you notes. Know, so, so some of you will be asking, so what is university education all about? And I'll sum up into three things that you really learn in any university environment. Okay? And these are the three things, uh, knowing and doing. Let me talk about knowing and doing. Knowing and doing means a knowledge, right? With knowing how to do accounting, what is debit, what is credit, what's an asset, what's a liability, what's an equity, you know, what's financial statements, etc., etc. That's knowledge, okay? And knowledge can be obtained through, uh, nowadays is can, you can Google anything you want on Google, okay? You watch YouTube, you can do anything from uh, frying an egg to making a bomb. You can, do, you can find that out on YouTube, okay? So that's uh, knowledge. Knowledge, you either sit down and you listen to knowledge or you read up to get knowledge. Right? Some young people today, they do it osmosis. They take the book near them and then they think that they will be transferring knowledge. But, um, but so that's what knowledge is. But having knowledge is not enough because you, how do you go out? Like I always tell people, you know, how do you learn how to swim? You can't learn how to swim by just reading the process of swimming. You have to jump into the pool. So that's doing. So doing means you, uh, you have to get, acquire the skills to actually do and apply what you've n- learned into a re- sort of semi-real environment, all right? So that's what you, you do case studies, you do, uh, you know, challenges, business competitions and stuff like that. We do it all here to allow you to actually learn how to do, not just know how to do it. So that's the two main things and most universities are able to cover knowing and doing very well. But the third thing that I always believe is, to me, is even more important than knowing and doing when you go to a university, is being. And what is being here is, um, uh, it it reminds me of a quote by uh, someone that I knew uh, that told me what universities are, where, you know, what universities are to young people today, right? So universities are places where you actually grow up, right? And, and, And become an adult and find what you really want to do. Okay, so you, 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 and, and hopefully you find what's the right way and the good way of becoming a, a person. So you grow up in a university. So, what, so to me, all this is summing up what I mean by being. Being means how to become a good person, 
how to make the right decisions, how to be strong and resilient during difficult times like these, where challenges are everywhere. All right? And this is where uh, uh, Harold Watt comes in because we have a program where we, which we call Empower, uh, which actually help students discover or young people discover, number one, what's their purpose in life. We, we think that by discovering your purpose in life, you will be able to withstand the constant struggle that you all be facing every day of your lives. Right? All of us want to search for happiness, but what's happiness? Happiness can be short-term happiness, right? When you watch a movie and you feel happy for that moment, and then when you come home, oh, all the challenges comes, comes back again, right? So happiness can be quite short-term. Long-term, sustained happiness means the resilience to actually go through all the struggles and challenges. And in order to do that, we think, we believe that our psychologist tells us that you need to have a purpose. You need to have meaning. And we do that. The moment you come in, the first semester, we actually have a program where you sit down with you a workshop over a certain period of time. We help you discover who you are, you know, uh, your purpose in life and how you want to activate that purpose and impact the world. Okay? You can change it later on, that's fine, but we start the process for you. So we are very focused on this idea of how to be a person, how to be a good person. Okay? And we are very uh, st uh, structured in, in, and very uh, forceful in, in that approach. Um, now, let me touch a little bit about the program that we have and it, that relates to accounting. Okay? And assuming most of you here and those in the audience uh, at home uh, really want to know how, you know how do I move from, let's say, and I assume all of you maybe at SPM level or at pre-university level, how, what do I do to really gain an accounting qualification? So, uh, so assuming you start from SPM, right? Those at home, uh, if you just set for your SPM and now you're waiting for results, uh, how do I know whether I've gained enough SPM, you know, a good SPM to actually start my path? Uh, normally, you can, as long as you achieve five credits, uh, you should be able to proceed. Uh, but first, what you need to do is to get uh, a pre-university qualification. Okay? You can go anywhere, but of course, as I said earlier, we hope you'll come to uh, Harold Watt so that we can start the journey of discovery of who you are uh, and your purpose with us. Uh, it, so, so you can join our, our um, uh, what we call our Malaysian Foundation program here. It's actually a one-year program, right? And uh, it prepares you for our university uh, programs. So how, how must you do in terms of the foundation program so that you can actually proceed to our university uh, you must achieve uh, four, C, four credits, four Cs with us, and then you can proceed. But if you are going to do our accounting program, uh, because of the quantitative nature of the accounting program, uh, we require to have at least a B in your maths, all right, for your SPM, okay? Uh, it can, doesn't have to be advanced maths, okay? It can be just your, your basic maths. Um, and then you join us at the undergraduate and we have uh, our programs are three years. Uh, we have the MA in, in accounting and business finance. Now before you start, wow, okay, it's an MA. Am I jumping my bachelor to become a master? Uh, no, you are not. Um, it's just that being a 200 year old uh, university, uh, being a two century year old university has its privileges. Uh, being an ancient university like us, we have the honour together with other ancient universities in the UK, for example, in Cambridge and Oxford and all that, to actually offer undergraduate degrees called a Master's of Arts, right? So don't worry, these are all at bachelor's level, undergraduate level, it's just that we call it the Master's of Arts, okay? So it's an honours degree, uh, three years uh, that we have. So you can spend all the three years here on, in Putrajaya Lake here for the whole three years, all right? Or um, you can actually uh, take advantage of the fact that uh, th our curriculum, so we are a global university, so whatever that we teach week by week is identical to uh, all throughout all our campuses. Uh, in fact, we, we actually have what we, call, what, what, what we call global teaching teams. So all the courses are being taught by a team of people across all the three main campuses, right? And as a result, they're all identical. 
So you can actually move around those three campuses at any time that you want. We call this the Glo Go Global program. You can't see it very well here, but it's called Go Global. All right. Um, and if you want, you, you don't want to spend time, or you rather you, uh, you want to spend one year in Malaysia, one year in in um, in Edinburgh, and another year in in Dubai. That's fine as well. Okay, because we are all uh, identical. So after that three years and, and uh, you complete your degree, you can start working, right? Your career starts that day after you got your certificate, right? And you can, you know, can do whatever you want, as I said earlier to, to uh, audience in, the, in social media. You, you, can be, you can go to KPMG and start work there. You can go out to corporate and start work there. Uh, you can, some of, us, some of my, my students uh, go out and start up their own businesses. Right? and they can start up their business there. If you want to become an accountant, then what you need to do is you need to now further uh, study to actually pursue and complete your professional qualification. All right? So we have advanced standing with ICAW, ACCA, CIMA, and CP Australia. Uh, you have a lot of exemptions uh, for their professional qualification or examinations, and you do maybe between um, four papers to right up until five and maybe seven papers. Okay, depending on the qualification that you have. So that's the pathway that, um, you know, if you want the journey through Harriet Watt. Uh, and I'm almost at the end. So I already talked to you a little bit about this just now. Uh, as I said, uh, our focus on the being part of uh, university education, where you learn how uh, you discover who you are and you discover your purpose in life. That's kept, uh, captured in our program. Again, it's not so clear which we call Empower, all right? And um, I, we, we think that's very important. And I leave you with this quote by uh, Mark Twain, which says that there are two important days in your life. The first day is when you were born. So when you, once you are born, everyone is important. You are valid. You are worth uh, you're a lot, you know? You're, you're very valuable. Uh, and then the second day becomes even more important to you is when you find out why you are here. All right, and I think all of us will search for that. And I search, and I found why I'm here when I'm 40 plus, because I never had an opportunity to come to Harrow Ward. But when you come to Harrow Ward, you'll have the opportunity to find out where you likely go are going um, when you are around 20, 21, maybe 22. Okay, so I leave you with that code, and now uh, happy to take uh, any questions that you may have. Uh, at questions from home, we probably have some questions from Pigeonhole, but because people travel here a long journey and take the risk, let me ask uh, the audience in the hall first if you have any questions before I take the ones uh, on the Pigeonhole. Welcome. I didn't have the chance to welcome you all to... to is that your first time here at, in the lake? Yeah, first time. Okay. Or is it the first time out of the house since one year ago? <laughs> No. Um, so we're currently working from home, yeah, and uh, all the classes are still online at the moment. Yep, but hope we, we are hoping and praying that we can go back, uh, come back to campus here very soon. Okay, so do you have any questions in the, in the, in the room? Yes, sir. Suresh, yeah. Hi. Um, this, uh, I understand now the programs are online programs. Yep. So how do students want to clarify points and all that, how can they, can they contact the lecturers? Yes, so, so currently, let me explain a little bit about our online uh, classes. And um, I, I actually don't like the word online classes. Uh, we are still functioning as a university. We are still focused on delivering a university education to everybody, right? Our preference, the, the, the teaching team, and, and I know the students uh, prefer that, and the teaching team prefers that as well. We want to come back to campus because that's the best way to interact. And, and, and you know, I've been teaching for 25 years. And it's so difficult to teach in a laptop. You know, you just see that 13-inch laptop, and, and uh, most of the time uh, they switch off their cameras. So I'm just staring. I don't know who I'm staring at. Like, like that, I know maybe there's no one in, in, in the internet at the moment. Um, so it's really frustrating for us. So we want to come back, right? So I just want to stress that we are not doing an online, um, it's, not a, it's not a MOOC course, it's not an online delivered course in the sense that you have videos and then you just do the work, read your own and then that's it, right? 
So we actually are going online to deliver, in a, try to deliver a face-to-face -face class online. Uh, so we are trying to deliver that sort of contact, but it has to be true online. So we are, we are doing live lectures. So, so we have all these materials, videos as well, but your timetable remains the same. So, so we have one week, if you have four, four courses, each course is timetable, and you, you literally come to class the same time, and the lecturer is there physically on the other side. We switch on our camera so you can see us, um, and, and we're trying to deliver that. So it's, it's a live lecture. It's not, not on, online. So I don't like the word online, actually. Um, and the same thing, so we have lectures, we have tutorials. So the, the, tutor the lectures, of course, being live, you can have hundreds of them. Uh, and the, the beauty of it now is that we can have a class that is, that is uh, broadcast across all three campuses. So you can now literally join our Herod University class and be with um, you know, uh, course mates in Dubai, course mates in the UK. But of course, we we'll take into account the timing, time zone, and everything. So these classes are normally around 4 p.m., 5 p.m., or 6 p.m. Yeah, but you are you you get to go in there, you know, and you and then some of the classes are being taught directly from the UK as well. Okay, but we still have tutorials, so you still break out into small tutorial groups of 20, 25 students, right? And where we still go through the problems or the the the, the cases with you, and and go through them with you, and and you have opportunity to ask questions. We, on top of that, you have also consultation sessions. Of course, you can't come and see me, so we go on a lot of platforms. It can be Teams, and you can just, you can on one-on-one, -on -one, you can call online, all that. So there will, it, it just want to stress that. So it's not like, oh, okay, the, the lecturers go off on a uh, trip in Langkawiga, you know, and then everything is automatic, yeah? So nothing is automatic. Our, our, it's actually become more stressful to teach online for all of us. So I just I hope that answers, and you get a right picture of what we mean by online. Okay, okay. Let me attempt to answer some question because of time. Um, so uh, this is a this is a question on, on MBA program, right? So how long is the duration of the MBA program, and uh, is the class uh, during weekends? Uh, they are ODL uh, learning mode. So the duration of the MBA program. This this is more for uh, people at home. It's actually a two year part time MBA that we have. Right? And these are more for working adults, so you need to have working experience. And uh, classes are held on weekends, right? So each class will have probably about three, three weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. Just imagine Saturdays and Sundays, you have full where we actually do interactive uh, learning online. For, for the time being, it's still online. Uh, so, so that's the, the weekend classes. We do have um, open direct learning in the sense that it's a MOOCs type of course where you can go online and study on your own. That's just for MBA. We don't have it for undergraduate. You can't go in and do on your own. So at the MBA level, we do have where, you know, we have just have videos and stuff like that and you can study at your own pace, right? And of course, the, the fees will therefore be very different, yeah, because there's no interaction there. So I hope that answers that question from Ganesh. Um, is coding relevant to future accountants? Do they need knowledge on how to code? Uh, my answer, and some, may, some may disagree with me, I don't think you need coding, right? Uh, give like, the chance to the computer people to code for you, okay? Don't take the whole, everyone's job, like, you know? So I don't think you really need to know how to code. It's not critical, right? Uh, what's more important is you can hire a coder to do all the programming for you, uh, but you tell them what is required. Uh, what's more important is to how to interpret that information and how to use that information to manage your, your business, right? I think that's more critical. So to my mind, I don't think accountants really need to know how to code. Uh, uh, am, am qualified as an accountant after finishing the degree in accountant? Or I still need to attend AC? No, yeah. So uh, the, the question is that are you a qualified accountant after you graduate with a degree? The answer is no, okay? To be qualified in Malaysia and in most countries, you need to have a professional qualification. Yeah? So that because there's a, the, the philosophy, uh, university education is just basic knowledge, fundamental knowledge. Uh, your applied knowledge needs to be enhanced to a, a, a more advanced level at the professional qualification level. Right? So you still need to do your ACCA 
to become a qualified accountant. It's like a doctor, right? You can study how many years in medicine in the university, but you still need to have practical experience and sit, need to sit for a certain ex uh, examination to ensure that you are at the level to practice. Same, same like lawyers as well, okay? And um, difference between business administration and international is, yeah, well, the, I, I guess, you know, if you look at international business management is more international. I guess most business programs today has got elements of international in them uh, because all business today are global, right? So uh, international business management is more international. Uh, in in uh, Harold Ward, we have two different types of degree. We have a Bachelor of Business Administration and an International Business Management degree. The difference between that is that the Bachelor of Business Manage Administration degree is more flexible. So there's a lot more options for you. Whereas the International Business Management degree is, is more structured and you will have to finish certain modules uh, compulsory. Yeah? So that's the difference between Business Administration and IBM. And I can't decide between accounting, business, finance, and business, and da, da, da. what's the difference between the two. Accounting, uh, I've already tried to explain what accounting is. It's really about using information to, to manage the business, right? And providing that information and, and um, interpreting that information. Finance is very much about um, funding your business, right? How do I source funding for, for our businesses? Uh, you know, where do I get the financing from, whether it's by borrowing or by uh, internal funds or by equity or shares, right? So you decide the best mix for that, okay? So normally, accounting and finance, they're quite intertwined, okay? So, you know, uh, you, you can't do one without knowledge in the other as well, yeah? So, uh, so that's the difference between the two. Uh, sorry, I'm speeding up a bit because I'm taking a bit of time off my colleague. Uh, career prospect or accounting degree versus career prospect and business management degree. Um, they are both the same to me. Um, so so my, my, <laughs> my, my advice, final advice, uh, as I need to close off now, is that um, you want to go in the business. There are many pathways for you to go in the business. Okay? Um, my, and, and there's no right or wrong programs to go. So many people, are, you know, at, at this cr crossroads in your life, you know, after, after SPM, go after pre-U, many of you are very, very concerned. I don't know, maybe pressures from uh, your, your, your friends and all that. Choose the right degree. If not, you are going to fail, right? My, th my advice to you is there's no such thing. You, you do what you, are, you choose today. Choose it based on what you, how you feel today, or what you are good at today, and, then, and do it. And then the future beyond that is, is up to you, okay? So there's no such thing as if I do an accounting degree, I'll be more successful. If I do a business degree, I'll be less successful. There's no such thing. So what you, your, your decision process should be is what am I good at now? If you're good at numbers and you're very detailed and you're very organized and analytical person, I think you would be very likely to succeed with an accounting degree. If you don't like numbers, and you see numbers, you give you scratches, your eczema all come out, then I, my advice to you is that stay away from accounting, go and do marketing, business, international business management, whatever it is. You will still become successful. It all depends on what you do. All right? So, so let me just end there by saying there's no such thing as a magic degree that you do and you become boom. Yeah, um, there's no such thing in business. Okay, you do whatever you want. You have accountants who are successful, accountants who are not successful. You are the business people who are successful, and you have business people who are not successful, right? So there's no there's no magic formula. What it is is that get on with your life, choose what you really are like at the moment, right? And just do it and do it the best. Don't go do, choose something now and say, oh, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it for the next three years. Right? Do something that you say, I'm going to like every day, I'm going to come, I'm going to do my best, I'm going to get a good, good qualification, and that's it. And then after that, that's your life. Okay? So uh, let me end here, as I've taken five minutes off my colleague's time, and uh, wish everyone all the best. I'm happy to take any questions out there, uh, if you like. And uh, uh, viewers at home, all the best to you. Please take care, stay safe, uh, and um, you know, wish you everyone well. Thank you. Okay.